Welcome everyone uh, to our, I think, fifth or sixth uh, Breaking into the Field series from the Forming the Future Working Group. Uh, this go around, we're focusing on finding your voice and niche in the peace and security field as an early career or an aspiring career individual. Our panel is actually really really incredible this go around. I mean, they've all been pretty incredible, but I, I have the opportunity to work with everyone on the panel and I can say that they are all really amazing. First of all, Deepika Chowdhury is the senior partner for narrative at Global Zero. I am reading bios, that's why I'm looking up there. I'm gonna do this professionally and move it down here though. So now I'll look at the screen too, so it's all perfect. She's the senior partner for Narrative at Global Zero. As head of thought leadership, she is responsible for creating and implementing storytelling strategies that build power and get us closer to a world without nuclear weapons. She is also responsible for all aspects of Global Zero's public presence, co-leading the organizing, co-leading the organization along with central government, the cent no, a central governance team, and supporting the development of her colleagues. Previously, Deepika was a communications director at the Nuclear Threat Initiative and managing director of the Peace and Security Collaboration of the Peace and Security Collaboration at Rethink Media. Highly experienced in providing strategic communication counsel, guidance during rapid response crises, media training and messaging on national security issues. She has also worked throughout her career to advance equity, diversity, and inclusion by centering voices of experts traditionally excluded from the DC-centered national security conversation with a particular focus on women and women of color. Thank you for being here, Deepika. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Next, I would like to introduce Istra Furman. Istra Furman is the program associate at the Peace and Security Funders Group, PSFG, as most of us know it. Acronyms are, are wild in peace and security. Uh, she provides support for all programs, operations, and initiatives. Prior to joining PSFG, Istra worked on nuclear disarmament and Pentagon spending issues at the Friends Committee on National legislation. Here's another acronym that stands for that. So FCNL, we're going to call it FCNL now. Easter led FCNL's legislative work on the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, seeking justice for communities harmed by U.S. nuclear testing and production. Thank you for being with us, Easter. Thank you for having me. And third, we have Lacey Healy who is the founding CEO of Inkstick Media, where she ser serves as the editor-in-chief of the foreign policy magazine, Inkstick, and executive producer and host of the PRX and Inkstick produced podcast, Things That Go Boom. Healy's reporting has appeared on public radio stations across America and the BBC where she's explored global security issues, including domestic terrorism, disinformation, nuclear weapons, and climate change. Thank you for being here, Lacey. And Thank Things That Go Boom is a really, really fascinating listen. If anyone is looking for a new podcast, I can recommend Thank it. Thank you. Thank you. So that is our excellent panel. Uh, I'm realizing I should introduce myself as well. Um, I am Meher Akshami. I am the program manager for the Organizations and Solidarity Program at WCAPS. That is to say the program within which the Forming the Future Working Group is housed within WCAPS, which is Women of Color Advancing Peace, Security and Conflict Transformation, an organization dedicated to promoting and supporting women of color in the peace and security field. I am acting as moderator of this panel. That's really all I'm doing here. So I'm less important. Now, the way we're gonna to structure today's event is I'm going to ask a few questions of our panel, let them sort of answer and provide groundwork for a, a following conversation focused around questions from the audience. 
So as we have them discuss answers to these questions and discuss the issues around finding your niche in the peace and security field, be thinking of your own questions and putting them in the Q and A, because we're going to leave time for all of you to have your questions answered by our panel. All right, I've just talked a lot. So let's get to some questions. Our first question is pretty fundamental and it kind of is necessary to frame the entire conversation. What do we even mean by building a niche or finding your own voice in the peace and security sector? Who wants to go first? You want us to jump in? I can jump in. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'll say building building a niche. That it it might be easy to uh, to to take this the wrong way, right? I I think I saw some comments when we were we were um, pushing this this panel out. Folks were like, "Oh, well, what do you have to do? You have to worry about branding now and the pieces. What has happened to the peace and security field?" Um, and I, I think that's the wrong way to think of this. I generally, when you're doing this kind of work, when you're doing any kind of research, when you're doing any kind of reporting, any kind of work that is is um, uh, information based, part of the job is making sure people read your work. Right. Part of the job is getting it out to places where where it can be seen. And part of your goal in literally any job in the world is to uh, create a space for yourself where you can advance as efficiently as you possibly can. Uh, I, I, that's probably your goal. Maybe that's not your goal, but if that's your goal, uh, you may want to elevate your profile in some way within that field. Well, one of the ways to elevate your profile within the, the particular field that you've chosen um, is to create a space for yourself to uh, to really uh, professionalize and um, become an expert in something, to uh, become an expert in the tools of the trade, uh, which these days include social media and publishing and a whole host of other things, um, and to really you know learn those things and learn to do them well. And I think that's what we're talking about when we're talking about creating a space uh, for yourself and one of the reasons why you might want to. Excellent. Thank you, Lacey. Sure. Istra or Deepika, do you, do you have more to add? You can go ahead, um, Istra. Okay. <laughs> I got gotcha. it. Um, so I'm, I'm quite new. This is actually just my second year in the peace and security space. So breaking into the field is still very present for me. Um, and I'll mostly be speaking from my perspective last year with nuclear testing compensation and that very specific niche within the larger nuclear field. And I guess for me as a young person, developing a niche is all about making a complex field more manageable. There are certainly some really smart young people who can fluently speak about every US weapon system, every geopolitical hotspot, but for the rest of us, I think it's very helpful to specialize. Um, and that also maximizes the opportunities where you're the one who sought out as an expert on an issue, even as a young person. And then I guess the last thing I would note on this is that you're more likely to affect real change that way um, by focusing in on a niche. Mm -hmm. Last year, as, as Mahar mentioned, I worked as a program assistant doing nuclear disarmament advocacy. And that year I did not disarm any nukes, but I did develop my niche working with communities in the American Southwest, in the Midwest and Guam to try to secure federal acknowledgement and compensation for the harms that they'd been through due to US nuclear testing and production and was able to make more progress on that issue when all of our other issues were really stalling. Um, so essentially, if you, if you are able to focus your learning or your activism in on a specific facet of peace and security that's near and dear to you, you're going to be more likely to get those speaking and writing opportunities and i think you'll be more effective um and i'll leave it i'll leave it there for now please d thank you um so well one agree with everything that lacy and Istra have have said but the way that i at least have thought about or think about 
developing a niche or finding your voice is, you know, maybe more related to how we kind of talk about showing up just in life and in the workplace these days, which is you're wanting to show up as yourself, like your whole self. And so one of the things that we've run into, and I think, you know, all of us have struggled with at times is feeling like you have to talk a specific way, look a specific way, be a specific way to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think part of figuring out what your voice and your niche is, is Un while understanding some of those dynamics that are very real and exist, figuring out the ways in which you can bring parts of yourself and your own interests and your own kind of passions and personalities into your work and carving out a space for yourself, right? So, you know, I feel like when I started in this space and like, I remember even when Lacey was starting in this space, still comparatively speaking, we were very consistently in rooms where there were not a lot of women um, at all, or people of color at all, right? And so, and 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 that was just kind of the time. So having to bring some of that energy and some of these questions around things of like, wait a minute, hold on, like you are forgetting this perspective was difficult, but very important. And like, we kind of had to figure some of that stuff out as we were going along. Um, but like Easter was talking about is, is finding the things that you are interested in and are passionate about and speak to you, even if it's not actually part of your current job description, but bringing that into your, your day-to-day -day work and starting to make sure that you're known for those things, right? Like I naturally was like, yeah, I want people who don't all look the same to be a little more in media. And just by, that was just a, a thing for me. And the more that I did that, the more that that kind of became my thing, if that makes sense. So I think just finding whatever that thing is for you. Um, and then when you are doing your work, it feels a lot more real as opposed to that you're just doing something because you were told to do it. So hopefully that was clear, <laughs> it wasn't confusing. Um, but, but that's definitely how I think about um, developing your voice and, and niche. Absolutely, yeah, I think all of that's really, really excellent. Excellent insight. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so our next question is connected to that one as logically they all would be, but it sort of gets into the the nuts and bolts of it because all these ideas are, are really great. Like bring yourself, make your niche, make yourself known, make it about you so that you know, you're true to yourself. All of that is excellent. How do you do it? how can you actually build that niche? What are the, the practical steps to be taken? Um, let's go with Lacey first, just to sort of yeah. change things up. Okay. Um, sure. I, uh, so how do you start to do that? Um, there are a lot of things that you can do, and I'm sure that we'll, we'll all uh, touch on sort of all of these things, but because it's one of the things that I do, let me drill down on opportunities to publish and how you might um, sort of engage uh, the public, whether that, that, you know, not just the public, uh, not, I guess the public as it were, as well as, you know, folks within your space um, more effectively, because that's one thing that I think that you can do. And I've seen people do very effectively, even before they've entered the field, right? They, they have, you know, say you're, um, you're, an, you're an undergrad, say you're in grad school, say you're working on these issues, or you're really interested in these issues, um, or maybe you're an interning, or maybe you're in your first role, and you just want to establish yourself. One of the first things that you can do, um, fortunately and fortunately, it, it, social media is available to everyone. You can jump on social media, you can start finding the people who are in your space, um, and uh, following those people, watching what they're talking about. Uh, and then as you become more comfortable, beginning to engage with those people in, the, in in what they're talking about. One thing that's really great about that goes back to something that Dee said, which is that uh, you want to be yourself, right? You want to come as a whole human. And you can't always do that in a white paper or uh, even an op-ed. 
But on social media, you can come as a whole human. You can bring your whole self. Uh, you can talk about that, you know, 18 foot skeleton that you really love at Home Depot. You can talk about uh, whatever, whatever it is that you are into. And I personally find that very valuable for um, getting to know folks outside inside of work outside of work beginning to form a full picture of of who they really are and um what they might bring to the table and so i wouldn't whereas it's very easy for us to just say like oh god social media is it's so much and it is so much and we all have to find ways to uh better balance on time and off time it is a very valuable tool to use um in your toolbox Publishing is another one, uh, whether, uh, and there are a number of, and I'll plug in stick media is one of those, but there are a number of outlets out there now that uh, are really open to folks who don't have a lot of experience, but may have a lot of education on a subject and are just getting into it, forming their views. Uh, they may, as we do, have a pretty intensive editing process to work with folks uh, to really get you published and get your voice out there. And once you have uh, some of those bylines to your name, uh, whether, you know, wherever they may be, or even if they may be on an organizational blog, say that you're uh, interning somewhere, you can use those and you can parlay those into other opportunities. Um, and it's also just really good practice to be able to uh, write, 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 even if you're not getting it published. Um, and, you know, pitch, pitch, pitch as much as you can, and you're going to get something. It's, it's just a matter of sticking with it. Um, and, and all of this is, of course, after you've sort of uh, drilled down in the area that you want to drill down in, which maybe some other folks will, will touch on that as well, but I'll, I'll seed the ground. <laughs> D or Istra? It looked like, yeah, D, go ahead. Looks like you okay, something. Okay, sure, I'll, I'll go. Well, that was a that was a really good, um, yeah, again, like, as I feel like this always happens anytime Lacey and I are on panels. I'm like, yeah, plus one to that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> We've worked together for a really long time. For those yeah. of you that don't um, already know this about, about the two of us, we've- Yeah, we've... yeah. We, we've been <laughs> also like peace and security and like the field is like I, yeah. I always say it's like it's like kind of incestuous sometimes like everyone's kind of knows everybody like it's just it's, it's yeah. one of those things especially when you're around long enough it's just uh, <laughs> hilarious so um okay so when it comes to you know developing your voice and niche I I would say in you know kind of to the answer to the first question it's like okay you have to bring yourself but I almost want to back up for a second and and pose a bit of a meta thing which is that you actually have to know yourself and you have to know what you want and how you want to show up professionally right which um you know I know this is going to sound which I feel like happens with a lot of the work that I just end up doing it sounds very much like I'm it sounds like therapy it's like who are you and what do you want um but it it really does require uh, a bit of that reflection or introspection and like a knowledge of who you are right now, how you show up in the world, and maybe how you want to show up in the world, right? So you might be a per particular way in your personal life, and you want to bring elements of that into your professional life, but you might not want to be like, I don't know, all of the things that you are to the people who know you the closest in your professional life. So in your professional life, you might want to be known as somebody who is really um, helpful, you might want to be known as somebody who is a really good leader. You might want to be known as somebody who is super professional and like knows all the technical things, right? But but knowledge of who you want to show up as and how you want to show up is really important in figuring out how to develop and use all of the different kind of mediums and platforms and spaces that Lacey was talking about, whether it is social media or writing or whatever else to, to further develop kind of that that bit so if you're like I don't know who I am and I don't know what I want to do you don't have to know immediately just know it's going to like grow and develop and change also like as you shift throughout your life and your career like anything else but it's much easier or it's a little bit more clear developing your voice is easier to do when you know what kind of voice you're you're trying to develop and toward to what end 
if if that makes sense. So that's that's my general thing. Like know who you are to develop a voice. <laughs> Simple as that. Just yeah. gotta know who you are. Yep. <laughs> Simple, but not easy. I feel like I say that. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, very exactly. simple, but they're not actually easy to do. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Istra. Yeah, totally echo everything that Lacey and Dee already said. Um, and I guess I'll just add a couple of specifics that might help you with identifying your issue or your niche. Um, my advice would be to, if at all possible, and I know this can be hard in peace and security, but to keep it personal and local, you could consider intersections between peace and security and other issues that you might already care a lot about, reproductive rights, digital access, queer identity, whatever that might be. Um, for me, I didn't so much develop my niche as stumbled into it. Um, I was connected with a, with a woman in my local area in Texas who had lost 13 members of her family to radiation-related cancers after nuclear testing. And she and her organization really mentored me and brought that issue very close to home for me. And just like Dee was mentioning before, something that's not in your job description, you can advocate to make it part of your job description. So I was really fortunate that my workplace supported me in making that part of my work and then going on to be able to accomplish a lot in that niche field. Um, you know, speaking on an NPR station, co-creating an educational website that featured survivors' stories um, and, and other things that we were able to do through that kind of specialization and focusing in. And then just a little more on, I'm not really the expert here, I think in publications or things like that, but on starting to get recognized in your field or your niche, uh, something that I think a lot of us have to learn is that you can be a great writer and that doesn't necessarily mean that newspapers are going to publish your work. So you really have to get your foot in the door um, leverage your networks that can be really helpful just to kind of like make it less of a luck game. Um, maybe you volunteered with an organization before and you can reach out to see if anyone there might be interested in working with you on an op-ed idea or you can follow big issues and use those as news hooks for your issue if they're relevant. So for example, maybe juxtaposing Russia's nuclear threats with the experiences of people who have already lived through nuclear detonations to show why this should never happen again. Um, and then finally, um, we have people here who are media trainers. If you have access to people like that in your life, it's great to be media trained before going on the radio or on TV. Um, but if you don't, some, some wisdom I've collected from my networks is to have a top line message that's fewer than 10 words ideally, and then about three points that you want to get across. And to get your points in early since you might not have much time or even as much time as they told you you would have. Um, so it's really best to memorize each of those things, rehearse any stories or brief facts that you'd like to share um, to make it smoother. Um, I feel like I've been speaking a bit, I have a, a kind of a, a note on the privilege aspect of getting speaking engagements and writing opportunities if there's time. Um, let me check in though. Yeah, absolutely, please. Um, I have a, a short follow-up. Really quick, I'll plug that. Um... Following this, we will be opening the floor to questions from the audience. So if you have them, now is the time to put them into the Q&A function, or you could put them in the chat. I can see them there too, uh, either way. But please, Easter, please go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to kind of like state outright that getting speaking engagements and writing opportunities is often connected to privilege. Uh, I likely benefited from privilege as a white person working at a pretty well-known organization last year. Um, and so if you are white or male, or maybe just not personally impacted by the issue that you're discussing, it's good to advocate for adding a co-author to your article, asking panel organizers to invite someone personally affected by the issue to join the panel. Um, something I've done in the past is ask for my honoraria to be donated to frontline community groups that mentored me. Um, so there's ways like that that you can, I guess, acknowledge and leverage your privilege as well. And I just wanted to to say that before we move on. Absolutely, I appreciate that note. Um, really quickly, mostly for my own benefit and the benefit of anyone the Gaul who is similarly afflicted, I'm curious if you have any advice, any of you have any advice for those of us who might be a little bit less inclined to be externally 
focus that is i don't use social media much and i am i don't know i don't necessarily want to be the face of anything but i know that it is a part of work and it is necessary do you have advice for those of us who are a little bit more shy for how to to get started with with building a niche yeah lacy you go first you look like sure. You <laughs> I so I I'm not actually the best person to ask because I'm a little bit that way um, on social media. I I don't know if folks when they speak to me maybe but maybe that's very obvious from my social media profile. But I'm um, I tend to I have to work at it uh, a little harder. Uh, I think what worked for me in the beginning was uh, engaging with a lot of retweets. Um, reading a lot, lurking a lot, uh, spending, uh, you know, probably more time. And this is a trap that I have to avoid falling into myself, which is that I will spend too much time sort of reading the discourse and, uh, trying to formulate how I feel like I should engage in it before I ever engage in it. Um, I think, that is in some ways good and in some ways bad and you have to find a good middle ground there where you uh where you pull the trigger and you you let it go um but there are safe ways to engage uh about you know if you're comfortable sharing things about yourself or your day or things like that um I don't always find those things super easy either <laughs> but but retweets sharing articles that you found uh that were really interesting um or came across sharing you know little pieces of of interesting information that you come across throughout the day if you don't want to make it about yourself because that definitely I mean for me at least if I put sort of a wall between myself and the information that I work on um it makes it much easier for me to share uh openly and another thing that I find find to be a little bit easier is if I share, um, like if I promote the work of my organization or a project that I'm working on or something like use that as the excuse to be on social media, to really promote the thing, the thing, and not so much the, the me, uh, that is all of those things are sort of, um, helpful to me. I hope that those are at all helpful to others who, face the same similar sort of uh issues yeah I would say again I'm I'm just going to keep being annoying thing plus one um but uh I think the other thing about you know that question about either not wanting to put as much publicly and actually you know it it has to do sometimes with our own like personal boundaries and like comfort levels is again kind of going back to what is it you're trying to accomplish right? If you are, because if you think about it, your presence, when we're talking about developing your voice and niche, it's not like, we're not in like influence, like Insta influencer land. Like we're not in like TikTok influencer land where we're like trying to promote, well, presumably maybe some of you guys are. Um, not like, yet. Right. Yeah, I know. Right. <laughs> yeah, like, right. But it's even, even in Instagram influencer land, like you are it's purposeful, whatever they're doing and showcasing, it actually does have an underlying purpose to it. So, you know, Myra, for you, if it's whatever your ultimate goals are, maybe professionally, or even if you don't quite know, even if it's like a short-term thing, it's like, okay, I want to do more of X. One, even asking the question, if it's necessary to be like public, public, or how public do you need to be? Is it, are you able to accomplish your goals by almost still being well-known within certain circles? Like you don't need to be well-known by everybody, but there are certain people, there are certain audiences that would help you get to your goal. Mm -hmm. So that can kind of help it not feel so overwhelming. Um, If it's like, hey, I know I want to get more cited in defense types of media, right? Like I really want to get an op-ed in defense one. And so let me follow this reporter or let me try to talk about this in this topic. Let me try to engage with their stuff. It, it, It makes it a little bit smaller instead of so overwhelming where it's like, okay, if I don't share every cool, funny, pithy thing that happened to me today and create this certain online brand and personality, then I'm not going to get any like recognition or attention whatsoever. So I think that like that piece of it is like, what are you trying to do? The why, and then the how becomes a little bit easier to manage. That makes sense. I'll just add on two quick other tips because I do identify with this question. You know, if you're more introverted, how 
can you take advantage of networking? How can you take advantage of social, social media? Um, one tip I have, maybe you're someone who doesn't love speaking with a group of people and you feel more comfortable in one-on-one -on -one settings. Every time I've started a position, I reached out to as many like cool contacts as I could or coalition partners to have virtual coffee. Um, I've been working remotely for quite a while now and just talking one-on-one -on -one, and that also helps them think of you later when, when perhaps they are trying to fill a slot for a panel. They know your interests, they know who you are. Um, and so those, those kinds of settings can be really good. And then it's also okay to lurk on Twitter. Um, I do think it's important to have a Twitter presence in this field, but I remember being told by my work, you know, sign up for Twitter, follow these politicians, follow these groups. And it's okay if you just kind of take a backseat at first and get a feel for what are people talking about? What are people not talking about where maybe my voice would be a helpful contribution or addition here? Um, and, and just following is is okay as well if if you're not the sort of person as as others have mentioned too is more of the influencer and sharer type. Excellent. Well, thank you all. Hopefully that was helpful to someone other than me as well. Um, all right. So we have a question from the audience to get us started in that section. We passed the half hour, so we're probably gonna dedicate the rest of our time to questions from the audience. So I'll plug it one more time, put them in and we'll answer them. So the question comes from, I'm gonna try very hard not to mispronounce this. And if I do, I apologize. Nandini, what organizations could help in the peace and security field or public policy field in terms of leveraging personal branding, writing, and or getting speaking engagements. So we talked about, I think there was a mention of, of, um, of organizations and, and privilege and, and some of, you know, and how you might get in the door um, with certain outlets. Uh, in by and large, you're gonna, it's gonna have to, be an organization that you are already a part of that's going to help do that. And so that's sort of where the problem comes in, right? Because, um, however, if you're in school also, uh, I, I think most programs have this, that the have, you know, sort of at least have some kind of opportunity for advisors to help you do this kind of thing or get this thing together, or you may be working on um, writing op-eds uh, and doing that kind of thing. Um, once you're in the field, there are some groups that exist to help uh, get voices out there like Rethink Media and uh, um, uh, I mean, but folks should should like jump in if there are others that I'm because rethink is the one that comes most uh, <laughs> immediately to mind as like that being the whole mission of like getting you know really getting folks uh, getting folks out there getting them the training getting working with them on their op eds and then pitching their op eds um, and uh, and and really making that happen. But also some outlets exist like ours that you know I mean and most outlets frankly take cold emails and I, and, and I'll say like, if you're trying to get into the New York times, yes, it might be um, a matter of like who, you know, and getting a foot in the door to some extent, but most outlets read most submissions, at least the first three few sentences. Um, and uh, cold email or no, they're they're gonna open your email if it says that you're sending um, a submission, and it may make a difference depending on the outlet whether or not you have the credentials for them to consider you uh, be, if they've never heard your name before because that's oh that is a consideration. So one tip that I give to folks is always if you're pitching an outlet, if you're submitting an op-ed to an outlet always say why you're the person to write on this subject. Um, even if why you're the person to write on the subject is just that you're currently writing a dissertation on the subject, that's a reason. And you know you don't have to have a fancy job title or a fancy former title to, to justify uh, publishing an article on a subject that you yourself have spent a lot of time studying. So, but, it, but you have to tell a person that 
uh, when you're submitting the op-ed for their consideration, because otherwise they might see your name, not recognize your name and think this could be like anyone because we're living in a virtual times. This could be anyone. This could be a catfishing someone like we don't know. We need to have some sort of um, sense of like who you are and where you're coming from and that you have some expertise. It's sort of like a good cover letter. You have to yeah. tell them what you're trying to tell them in a clear yeah. way that gets them to where you need them to be. Yeah. yeah. Makes in sense. like a tenth of the space of a cover letter so it's yeah, like a real yeah. trick but <laughs> well i think we can all agree that yeah. everyone writing a cover letter and everyone reading a cover letter wishes the cover letter was taking about a tenth of the space also that's a good point <laughs> uh, d yeah i would say um you know basically where if you're affiliated with anybody right if you're affiliated with an organization if you're affiliated with a school if you're affiliated with a program current or even former they should be the ones kind of helping you. Um, like a mentor should be the one kind of helping you um, getting your foot in the door. Uh, just because like Lacey said, they just wanna know who you are and that you have some street cred to talk about what you're talking about. And that does not even mean that you have a degree in the topic. Um, so for example, if uh, you wanna talk about whatever is happening in your local community, just the fact that you're in that local community gives you some authority to talk about that. So it doesn't mean you have to be an expert, but you do have to demonstrate why it is you are talking about a particular topic. So um, yeah, pretty much if, if the, if I'm remembering the question correctly, it was like organization or individuals to kind of help you get your foot in the door. Was that, was that accurate? I More focused on organizations, but yes. Okay. Yeah. Organizations. So basically um, an organization that you are a part of. Like it's, it's kind of an annoying answer, almost it feels like, but I think that that's still accurate because more likely than not, somebody at that organization has experience in writing or publishing. Um, and if for some reason they don't, uh, there are so many different like mentorship programs, intern programs, um, like just intro to like how to write X, Y, Z types of resources. I know Org and Solidarity has stuff on their site. I know WCAPS has stuff on their site. I feel like Gender Champions has stuff. Um, so just finding any sort of inroads through those, those platforms um, tend to help quite a lot. Since it came up, I can actually plug uh, WCAPS spins some effort to try and, and support People, well, women of color specifically in the field and finding those inroads. Um, there are some structured approaches. For example, uh, they have, they, we have a pipeline fellowship program for early career folks that, that does help with mentorship and with getting sort of in information and knowledge about this. And, and there are things focused around op-eds and all sorts of fun stuff with Ian W. Caps if if that is of interest to anyone. So just plug that really quick there. Uh, Istra, I want to make sure we hear from you because I'm feeling you have a, a, a interesting additional perspective. Thank you. Um, I'll second the plug for Rethink Media. Um, they publish an AM Nukes Roundup, which is helpful to sign up for. You don't have to be affiliated with an organization and also a peace and security editorial calendar. And that can basically show you, is there an important anniversary coming up that I might want to include at the news hook of my op-ed? Um, a couple of outlets that particularly like publishing um, people with diverse perspectives, obviously Ink Stick Media, Outrider, Responsible Statecraft are a couple that come to mind. Um, and then I would also just think expansively about what might be an organization that can help you uh, find opportunities Sure, it could be, you know, an organization within the peace and security field. It could also be perhaps a spiritual community that you belong to, a volunteer network. The first time I was published, it was because um, I found a Texan Quaker, I'm also a Quaker, who was interested in nuclear issues and willing to put his name down as a co-author on a piece that I'd written about Texas downwind communities. And so there may be kind of creative ways that you can leverage, well, what identities do I have? What networks can I tap into? Um, if you have professors, you know, they might be willing to recommend a couple of places to you as well. Excellent. 
Thank you all so much. Um, all right, our next question is a little bit more focused. Let's say you've started the process, you're a little further down the line. How can you find balance when developing your niche? For example, in terms of setting boundaries on what you take part in or feeling pressure to have a hot take on developing events or having to take every single speaking engagement offered, writing opportunity, and, and sort of once you're in that place, it can feel, especially when you're early on, that you have to do everything in order to stay relevant. How do you find that balance? Actually, <laughs> yeah, Dee, please. Oh yeah, I have I have big opinions on this one. Um, so uh, especially you know when you know I've, like right like Lacey has been in in the media space and as like a CEO um, of like a media organization and I know you've been doing a lot of stuff. So I'll let you talk about your own experience in that. But as somebody who has to and has had to train folks over the years and like talk about here's your professional profile, um, and everyone is so different. I again, this is, a, this is going to sound like really therapy-y, but it's, it's what I have found to be true, which is you just have to pay attention to how things are making you feel. And what I mean by that is when you're jumping in on that hot take on Twitter, are you feeling like, hey, you know what? That was actually kind of fun. And like, I enjoyed like getting into it and like snarking a little back and forth. Or does it leave you feeling like exhausted and drained and just like, ugh, like, I don't, I don't feel good about that. Um, same thing when it comes to accepting speaking engagements, if it's like, you know what I felt, which has happened to me where it was like earlier in my career, I accepted a speaking engagement. And then I realized, or I, I personally felt pretty tokenized by my invitation to that speaking engagement and my participation on it. I was like, oh, this, this doesn't feel good. Right. And I, I ended up later on when that happened to me again, I was able to have more of a conversation of like, actually, I, I do not want to join this situation. Right. So I think really paying attention to your own energy levels into your own, like how it really does make you feel and what it is that you want to do and the things that you are trying to accomplish as opposed to acting and behaving in ways that somebody else or some magical voice in your head is telling you you should be behaving. So it's like, do you want to do this? Or do you think that you should be doing this? And like parsing out what reactions are which and, and making your decisions accordingly is pretty much like the only and best way I have ever figured out how to, how to manage that balance. The question I come back to a lot is, who are you competing with? Because if the answer is a non-existent version of yourself that you think will be better, that's probably not a healthy way to approach things. Yeah, it's who are you competing with? And also whose voice is that in your head? Mm -hmm. Is it your own voice or is it actually somebody else's voice yeah. saying something to you? It, and it's actually not your voice. Usually if you pay attention for a second, it's somebody else's voice saying that, um, that you should be, be like acting or behaving in a certain way or, or taking on a certain thing. Um, yeah. and, and that's usually a pretty good indicator to like, just not. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Istra or Lacey? I can jump in. I think that was some really great wisdom from, from D and kind of the introspective elements are, are helpful to think about. Um, this is also something that I've had to grapple with in this space. I think as many of us do, I definitely, you know, came in wanting to be someone who says yes to everything who goes above and beyond I think there was like a particular somewhat unique pressure of working with frontline community groups for whom this was their life and not their job. And so I kind of felt the pressure to, to have this be more than a job to me as well, take calls late at night from the people I was working with. You know, I spent unpaid weekends at the library going through thousands of death certificates for a project that an organization had asked me to help with. So it really became an area of personal passion, which is good and okay and certainly will help you build trust and rapport with the people you work with but i also think there's a place where you have to learn that as an advocate as an activist your help is more valuable if you can sustain that work in peace and security and not burn yourself out immediately um and i also i think learned through that process that it's easier to set boundaries at the beginning than at the end so it really is okay. You're not going to hurt people's feelings if you reschedule a call that you get late at night when you're with your family, or if you have to refer someone to a different advocate, you might have more bandwidth at this time to help out. Um, 
And I guess I'll quickly just mention ghostwriting as another thing that might come up. And other people on the panel might have different different perspectives from me here. Um, but but my my thinking about ghostwriting in your early career is complicated. I do think that getting your foot in the door should include having something to show for your work on your CV. Um, and and you know, if you're being pressured to ghostwrite things for bigger name colleagues, that's that's a problem. And I do think we're seeing work culture go in the right direction on this. For example, there's a new union negotiated contract at the Center for American Progress that ensures that junior researchers get co-author credit on things that they write with their more famous or more well-established colleagues. And, you know, I think with the culture heading in this direction, um, with the recognition that your time is valuable too, it's it's okay to push back and advocate for, for having yourself listed as an author on a project that you'd um, contributed your time to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%, 100% agree. <laughs> um, and I hope that this is happening less and less, but it's probably something we should be talking about more and more. Um, who boy, on the um, passion point, uh, I started my own organization. So <laughs> I'm probably not the best person to be talking, telling people, uh when and when not to um to turn it off uh because it's very hard to do that when you're you're running your own thing um but then again maybe i am exactly the right person because i also have four kids and um it is almost impossible at some point to uh balance all of that without just shutting things off sometimes uh, and so you you have to, and I just have to go back to to Dee's point even earlier, which everything that you both said was so great, but uh, you don't have to do all the things all the time. What you have to do is figure out who you want to be and how you want to engage. So, so that means you don't have to be the breaking news person. You don't have to be the hot take person if that doesn't make you feel good. You can be the person who creates an email list with a, a key number, like 15 defense reporters on it, who you keep in contact with on a regular basis and send your work or send, you know, what whatever you happen to be doing. The, the key is that you're doing something to push yourself out there because you can't just build it and they'll come. That's not how it works. You do have to openly advocate for yourself in some way. And that doesn't have to be on social media. That can be um, in any number of forums that speak to uh, the type of uh, career that you wanna create for yourself. And I'll just put in a quick plug, that career doesn't have to be a career that you see that someone else has. Now, it is very helpful if you can see that someone else has the career that you want to have, but um, that didn't really exist for me, And uh, but I knew what uh, gave me, uh, I, I knew what lit a fire under me, I knew what I was passionate about, and I knew what I wanted to do. And I kept doing that until I carved a space for myself. And um, the plug is that we actually have a creative capsule residency uh, with um, Bombshell Toe that's launching soon. And we're uh, accepting uh, app uh, pitches, uh, uh, proposals for right now to come and work on a project with us that is uh, something that looks like what you want to be. And we're accepting people at all levels. Um, so take a look. I dropped it in the chat uh, and see if it might be a good fit for you because that's one potential pathway into the field. <laughs> Just adding a link for, for bombshell toe. Yeah. Um, also, That's lovely am I am for folks who aren't uh, oh, not just bombshell too. <laughs> yeah, for the for the rare people who somehow don't know who lovely am I am is, it feels like everyone does, in peace and security. Um, <laughs> she's amazing. The organization is amazing. That's a great plug. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you all for that. Uh, we have ten minutes left and two more questions. If anybody else wants to sneak a question in. So I am going to say, 
let's sort of rapid fire answer these last couple of questions so just so we make sure we get through them and if anyone else sneaks any more questions then we might be able to get to them as well so next up we have from nandini again and again if i mispronounce your name my apologies for recent grads any specific tips on how to leverage a network within an in-person event around sort of getting your voice out there and your niche out there? Finding your niche. There we go. Leveraging an in-person event to getting yes. your voice out there? Uh -huh. um, I actually, this reminds me of Eastro's point earlier, basically going around, either getting their information card, whatever else, giving yours and actually emailing them, asking if sometime in the next couple of weeks, they have time to, for a coffee in person, a virtual coffee, just whenever, um, and doing an informational interview. I'm like a big informational interview evangelist. There's a whole New York Times article on how to do this. Again, Lacey's heard me plug this so many times over the years, but it is the way to build a network because people just tell you to go out there and network, um, not showing you how to do that. Um, so basically set up an informational interview. And if you don't know what that is, I will drop a link in the, in the chat um, or look it up and, and do that and, and you'll be fine. <laughs> That's my advice. Yeah. Place your East Coast, yeah, plus one. <laughs> Have an elevator pitch maybe. Uh, I mean, it, but you know, one that's not like, you know, one of those cheesy old pickup lines, like, like, <laughs> that doesn't, doesn't feel forced. Um, one that is, you know, just a, a really quick way to describe who you are and what you do. Uh, if you're having a conversation with someone and yeah, be comfortable asking for their information and then emailing them afterward. I haven't personally done this, but one tip I've heard is to keep like a log book with your cards, put them all in and then write, mm -hmm. make yourself write a sentence afterward about what context you met this person under, how you want to reach out to them, um, anything that you all can go on uh, for your conversation later. Also, I should have mentioned when setting up your like virtual coffees or informational interviews, as Dee put it, it's helpful to do a bit of background research just to know what common experiences you all might share that you can talk about, have that elevator pitch about yourself ready, um, and then and then know what perspectives you want to ask them to speak from with you. Um, just a little bit of background research is always helpful. I'll add one thing quickly here because I have a lot of opinions on networking. For me, it helps to look at networking as speaking to interesting people about interesting things, not as a means to an end because that helps a lot to sort of remove one, the fe feeling of transactionality and two, the pressure to make it perfect because it is just having a conversation with a person. person. Mm -hmm. um, okay, rapid fire through the rest of these questions. Uh, Nandini, I believe the, the link is already posted, so should be good on that one. So we have two more, so quickly. Um, how does a recent graduate student seek mentorship around this in their field? And swinging for the fences, to be fair, I'm going to include it. Would any of you be interested in mentoring? Well, I'll just direct you back to the link uh, that I dropped in the chat because that that's part of this residency is that lovely of Bombshell Toe and I um, really see an opportunity to mentor some folks who are interested in taking a more creative multidisciplinary approach to peace and security issues. And um, that's really the purpose of this, this program. So it really is uh, both a residency and also a, a heavy mentorship program where we'll have an advisory board who will serve as mentors as well. Actually, I just realized, I, I just noticed, I think our links are only going to the hosts and panelists. So our folks uh -oh. are not finding them. Oh, I no. No, I just realized. So I uh, wanted to do a follow-up uh, with with the the links. Um, yeah, well, I'm going to I'm gonna answer your last question first, which is I, I do not feel I have capacity to mentor anybody right now, which is, I think, another important thing is like, for you should be wary of people who are always offering to mentor you because effective mentoring is actually like takes some like real time and dedication. Um, and I think uh, 
finding good mentors is, um, again, also like an art form or a skill. It's somebody basically who has a set of skills um, or seems to embody some skills or a career path that you also would want to emulate parts of at least um, and seems capable of giving you some like time and consistent, honest feedback and energy over time. So that can be somebody that you work with. It can be somebody that you previously worked with. It could be somebody like, I wouldn't say that like, like a total stranger on a panel, I feel like you would want to get grab coffee with them first and see if you like, like them or whatever else, like, you know, build up to it a bit. Um, but uh, yeah. And there are some, again, I think there's some really fantastic um, mentorship programs and a lot of ones that have been started and, and hosted a lot of the, the various organizations represented both here and um you know, uh, within the space. I will again plug WCAPS has a mentorship program. I'll put a link in the chat. Istra. I don't think I have anything to add to the great things that have already been said. I also don't see myself as a mentor, but please do share my email. If anyone has questions, I'm happy to talk to you about, you know, my own journey, um, anything that I might be able to give advice on. Excellent. I'll put that in the host and panelist chat for now. Actually, I changed it. You should be able to send messages to everyone now. All right. Yeah. Ooh. Okay, so we have four minutes and one final question. Um, I think it's a pretty good one to cap off on, actually, because I think it connects to everything we've been talking about recently. If we have follow-up questions or would like to speak further, would panelists mind being connected on LinkedIn or via email? Go for it. <laughs> yep, go for it. A resounding <laughs> yes from everyone. So feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. They, uh, actually, I think I, I think they, if you have the PDF flyer for this event, all of their LinkedIn's are linked on the flyer or just look them up by name. That works too. All right. So thank you, Topeka, Istra, Lacey. Thank you all for your time and your expertise and your presence in general. It's wonderful to talk to all of you. Uh, thank everyone who attended today. Thanks to everyone who attended today for being here and for your questions and for your engagement. This event will be recorded and made, well, it was recorded and it will be made public. So after the fact, if you think of something that you remember hearing but can't quite get the details, you can scrub back through and get to that. So it will be available and that's it from us. <laughs>